So I started my career as a medical researcher before transitioning to consulting just over four years ago. My scientific training has shaped the way that I think about approaching problems, developing hypotheses and collecting evidence to make a robust judgment. This is no different to how I approach my role as a consultant in the evaluation and review space. I work predominantly for government, research and nonprofit clients and work mostly in the areas of science, R&D and health. But I also dapple in a wide range of skills and disciplines. So with that background in mind, I wanted to talk through some of the similarities and differences from my perspective between social impact measurement and evaluation. There are two different schools of thoughts on these ideas. Social impact measurement and evaluation are labels for sets of communities, cultures and attitudes. They often involve work of different scale, resources, timeframes and use different techniques. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you today is are labels important? Does it matter what we call ourselves and our work? And where do our communities fit? So is evaluation a subset of social impact measurement? Is social impact measurement a subset of evaluation? Or are they two completely separate ideas? And if so, what are we doing here today? Um, and if we are one, why do we have different names? So from my perspective, both social impact measurement and evaluation involve critical thinking and inquiry. They involve testing assumptions and asking questions in order to seek a deeper understanding. They both compile evidence to then assess and make a judgment about the effect of a program. And they both bring accountability to the way that programs, organizations and society operates. Another interesting point about social impact measurement and evaluation is that they're both discipline agnostic. So they draw on the best of economics, philosophy and environmental and social sciences. To me, social impact measurement is practical and applied. It involves more timely assessment, often using fewer resources. Social impact measurement is a new and exciting emerging field of practice. On the other hand, evaluation is more rigorous. It can involve more uh, resources, be more resource intensive. It involves complex assessments and often uses detailed frameworks to build an evidence based And it's a more well-established practice. So within the work we, are do, we do, there are some elements that are more likely to be distinctly social impact measurement and some that are more distinctly evaluation. But there's also a lot of overlap. And I think we can think of these two concepts as more of a spectrum rather than a distinct set of practices. We also know that this is true of the members of each society. So some of you will be members of both SIMNA and AES. So there's clearly overlap in the types of work you engage in and the ideas that you subscribe to. Another thought I wanted to raise is designing for purpose. Designing for purpose is essential for every evaluator or social impact measurer. Each program and policy is very different and they serve different people, context needs and timeframes and they often have very different resources associated with them. This is also true for assessment of these programs. So there are pros and cons to both ends of the spectrum of social impact measurement and evaluation. So for example, in the extreme, it's not always practical or appropriate to conduct a robust randomized control trial evaluation. This may not deliver the best results for the context and the people involved. On the other hand, on the social impact measurement end of the scale, a simple measurement that delivers practical insights ready for implementation as a program is delivered may not satisfy those seeking to make low risk decisions or maintain program fidelity and continuity over the life of the program. So as a consultant, I seek to ensure that my work reflects these differences and is fit for purpose, whatever that purpose is. So if the cultures are a continuum, then the big question for me becomes how can we learn from each other and spread the importance of the work that we do? So there's been a push in recent years to bring more accountability into programs and policies across government, nonprofits, and the private sector. And this has led to more evaluation units and teams seeking to work with and alongside program delivery and policy. However, these evaluation units can face challenges working with the organization and demonstrating their usefulness. They're often engaged late in the life of a program and can be negatively perceived as critical assessors. So some of the big challenges that I've come across in my work are, how can we better, pro how can program designers better incorporate planning and measurement into evaluation? 
So this includes building in flexibility as the program evolves, but also including iterative learning and performance improvements over the life of the program instead of a simple end of program review. Another big question is how do we instill the importance of evaluation or social impact measurement? So how can organisations support their staff to better value this way of thinking? To understand that it's not something to be feared, but instead is something that can improve performance and drive change more quickly, efficiently and appropriately. So the three key messages I want you to take away from the talk for discussion later on. Uh, are labels important if we exist on a spectrum? It's important to design for purpose, whatever that purpose, and that progressing our work matters more than our differences. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Simon. Thank you, Laura. Lots, lots in that, lots in that. And I will just share my screen first of all. So one moment. There we go. So first of all, acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Bunurong people, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And there's much of what Laura said, which I, I inherently agree with. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to take an angle though in describing what I think some of the differences and similarities are by first of all, reflecting on this fantastic band called uh, Tool. Some of you may have heard of Tool before. They had an album in 2001 called Lateralis. And the album cover uh, of Later Lateralis had layers. It was these plastic sheets and it had a different part of the, of the body that was representing. And so the human body has so many different systems. You know, there's the skeletal system, there's the muscular system, there's lymphatic resp respiratory systems, digestive systems. There was quite an extraordinary um, album cover. And I think that analogy works when we're thinking about identity of those in the evaluation community and those in the social impact community. So there's a lot, necessarily, there's going to be quite a lot of overlap. And there's also going to be a lot of differences in what we are, what we're describing. Um, th that's the case, because we're trying to apply lots of different thinking depending on a specific context. So just first a shout out to Fresh Spectrum who have some sensational um, cartoons to use for presentations like this. Just taking evaluation as an example, and I hope this resonates with most of you. Um, when someone asks about what evaluation is, like the real question is what isn't evaluation? It's really broad. And I started my life as a philosopher, moved into strategy consulting, and then started working uh, in strategy type of projects and measurement and evaluation type of projects for within the social sector. And the answer to a question like this is nearly always, it depends, or I can find a way of making that work. There's so many different ways that this um, uh, cartoon, I feel, answers the, 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 the question at the heart of this discussion today about the difference is that, well, yeah, there's, there's actually not many differences because it could be anything when it comes to our own identities and how we're thinking about it. Laura touched a little bit on this, but I want to emphasize it because I find this is central to how we think about evaluators and social, the, the social impact measurement community. My whole professional life has been based around getting this right in scoping work for any client. It's a question about rigor. It's understanding how far you go to get a meaningful answer, who it's for, the audience, and the purpose. Why are we doing it? Laura was sort of talking about evaluation being more rigorous, possibly inherently. I put that out there that some evaluations with that label and evaluators don't necessarily apply that high threshold of rigor. And so that identity associated with how we approach rigor and how we approach purpose, fit for purpose, could mean I've got an hour with you. Let me work out what's going to be most appropriate to help you make a better decision. So just want to make sure that we all hold these three concepts around rigor, audience, and purpose. You can think of them as the Holy Trinity um, as we're considering the differences and similarities. 
it also becomes quite central to our identity. Are you the person who will always ask the next question about rigor to make sure it's really going to be right? And it might take another year, but is it really going to be right? Or are you the type of person who goes, I like to find the audience as the community and therefore what's rigorous might take a year or five years to be able to work through what's required. So just hold these three as you're thinking about the differences and similarities between the two communities. As you can see from my background, I sort of thought this particular uh, cartoon was rather apt. Um, I'm often asked this question, particularly with 200 days of lockdown right now. You know, Daddy, do you like my picture? I'm like, honey, if you'd like me to be objective, I'd have to create a rubric. So go back to the purpose, audience, and rigor. Depending on if you're an evaluator or if you work within social impact measurement, your rubrics may be similar. They may be quite different. There's a strong overlap between different uh, methods and approaches in how people are thinking about this. And the key part here is considering what's required to make a meaningful answer. So in this case, if my audience is my daughter, um, purpose is to have a positive, happy interaction, the level of rigor is almost non-existent. But if it was like the Archibald Prize and my daughter was showing me her creation, I'm like, okay, now just not good enough. That's going to be some of the differences that we all face, regardless of which community we're in, as we consider what's appropriate, what's fit for purpose, and what's the appropriate level of rigor. One thing, oh, I'm sorry. And we're back. Um, these, these are a couple of cartoons here I want to highlight, um, just to emphasize some of the problems with uh, different methods and approaches and the identities that we all have. Sometimes rigor can be synonymous with being, uh, having a rigid approach to what's required, or it might be forced by a particular um, client, be it an organization or department. Um, one thing, uh, and then, sorry, the next one is just around being adaptable to environments that fit for purpose message comes into play. It may appear through these cartoons that I'm being critical of the evaluation community. There's a really important point I want to emphasize right now, which is that the evaluation community is much more established than the social impact measurement community there and the similar community. That's why there are cartoons, which I'm able to find very easily. I can't find cartoons for the similar and uh, social impact measurement world. Uh, Evaluation identity is much more defined, has a longer history and has had more evolutions. Uh, and the professional pathway is clearly articulated. It's very different it's, uh, to the similar community where we're currently at, at the moment. The social impact measurement identity is newer and it's not that same long history. It's attracted people from all sorts of different uh, disciplines and there isn't a clear professional pathway, although that is evolving with Social Value International and the pathways for accredited practitioners. So this does become a question of culture and identity. And I do straddle both communities uh, and presented at AES conferences and other webinars before, and also led the establishment of SIMNA. And I just wanna emphasize that there's many similarities, but there's significant overlaps as well between the two communities. The key difference though, are the cultural differences and the identity that sits between people who primarily associate with the AES or primarily associate with SIMNA. And for the final thing I wanted to do is just to point to the vision and mission for both organizations. Now, I'm not sure how revamped, new, refreshed, alive the AES vision and mission may be, but I think that speaks strongly to the very focused direction of the identity associated with the um, AES. And for SIMNA, this is a vision that we've worked and, and mission that we've worked on recently and beginning to share more widely. Um, there's a difference in focus and approach to what we're both potentially trying to achieve and therefore how we're approaching the work of measuring change over time and evaluating it at specific points in time. 
might pause there and I'll actually open up to Laura. Um, as you all would have been aware that we would have had lots of time to be able to work through this given lockdowns across the country. But Laura, I'm interested if you've got any initial reflections, first of all. Thanks, Simon. And um, I will stop share. Very interested to hear you talk about the adaptability of, of ourselves and, and a lot of people on these calls um, to the clients that we might have or the way that we practice evaluation. Um, being able to adapt, you know, with different resources and timeframes and, and frameworks to deliver fit for purpose measurement. I wonder if it's also about the adaptability of the clients that we work with. I mean, from my perspective, doing most of my work with government, I've never seen social impact measurement on a tender, always evaluation. And I wonder if that's um, because of its more established rep um, reputation um, or, or why that is. And I'm curious to hear, I guess, who are the clients that you predominantly work with and is it them wanting social impact measurement or evaluation? So I think the, the words are very important. You highlighted up, highlighted up front about labels and are labels important? The word measurement, is it synonymous with or could be a parallel with monitoring? And so there's monitoring and evaluation or monitoring and evaluation and learning, MEL, is often used and requested from different government type of clients, um, as well as with some of the larger uh, nonprofit organisations um, and increasingly spreading. So I wonder if there's an important overlap here between the evaluation community, which necessarily thinks about monitoring as an essential part of the work that happens, and social impact measurement, which has that monitoring angle, but it's probably pushing towards making a decision faster. So making, taking the information and making the decision faster. So beginning to see a lot more of that happening, even with sophist uh, sophisticated government clients where it's been pitched as an evaluation, but necessarily it's more working together. So it starts to become more of a development evaluation, developmental evaluation approach. And I've, that's what I've seen in the evaluation community over time, much more of that convergence to, we're gonna to work together over time and we'll see what happens, which I see as being much more of a parallel with the social impact measurement thinking and approach. And then curious, so I, I raised at the end of my talk, uh, a question about perceptions and how I'm often see, perceived and how my colleagues are perceived. Curious to hear whether you face any of those challenges in being perceived as kind of an outsider that's come in to audit almost rather than work with um, to deliver to deliver outcomes. The word the labels important. I'll go back to that point. I think it's excellent that you raised that and that fed into the culture and identity that we all bring to any work that we are doing. And so I do think that there's uh, that word audit is critical. I don't think of the work that I do generally has been auditing. It's often working more around, well, what does this mean? Where does this come from? What, where do we want to go with it? So much more, even if it's a more traditional evaluation, it's much more, well, the world is changing. The world is dynamic. The culture and identity that's sort of brought with the, from the social impact measurement perspective of the world means that well, we're going to adapt necessarily. We're going to help do something that's going to help you do something different sooner rather than later. So perhaps the difference there is the time frame of when we're trying to get results that will be useful. And that will change. And I know we've got people from all different types of sectors who are working in different types of sectors on the call. But that purpose audience rigor bit comes into play very strongly um, once again. But do you see that identity that you bring when you're working with a, a client sort of come to the fore in how the interactions take shape? Definitely. Um, and I think it's, again, it's all about that, that circle you put up of, um, of audience rigor purpose. Um, because I don't think, I think there's a, a, a culture or feeling around the particular project and how the project is set up and, and tightly defined, um, even if the same term is used. So, mm. Yeah, so I think the sentiment changes, but it might still be called an evaluation, for example. Yeah, okay. The other 
there's another one thing I think that you've triggered for me as well with this. There's a, a more of the culture with social impact measurement can or can be around the investment community and more of the private sector trying to work out what has changed. So some of the different um, clients working with have got that quite overt impact investing lens. And so it means that, well, it's going to be much more related to specific changes that can we relate back to payments, for example. So payment by results contract or social impact bonds and talking about social impact measurement in that way, that's quite a different mindset, culture, identity to we've got a policy, it's $50 million, uh, we've got dedicated to these programs, we're going to invest in it, let's see what happens, it's a four-year evaluation, let's start now, two years time, let's hear the report, what's going on, quite a different mindset and time frames again um, around that. Definitely, and I think to some extent, um, when you're talking about social impact measurement for payment by results or social impact bonds, if they're government run contracts that have private investors, often those are even much more rigorous in my experience because they have so, such a high level of accountability in order for government to pay out results to private um, investors. Indeed, indeed, which is where if there was one comment you made up front, which is around evaluators being more rigorous. I think at times social impact measurers or the social impact measurement world has to be incredibly rigorous and possibly more. So I find that that's where I see the similarities between the two different approaches, which is where the, 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 mission, the vision and the mission of both organisations come. So what are we trying to achieve from this? And that's maybe where you highlighted some of this about what we can learn from each other. It's like, well, is, is there something that we're directing our energies towards? Is it good evaluations or is it a different type of world? And I find that part and that drive really interesting as a part of this, because I do see that the audience purpose rigor, looking at timeframes, how we scope projects, adaptability, overlap of different methods and approaches being a big part of the similarities of what we can all take and apply um, in, our, in our professions. I agree more. Um, maybe it's a good time to, to throw it open to the polls. Um, so Francesca's set up uh, some Mentimeter polling to get us all um, involved and, and communicating what, what you all think. So if you can log on um, to the link that Francesca's just posted in the chat line, there'll be a couple of que uh, questions there. Francesca, did you want to run us through that? Print? Thanks, Laura. So I've just um, put the link in the chat, hopefully everyone can see that. And there are four questions. Um, so you're able just to go through them and then I will put the results up on the screen. I think this was the point where we have the music in the background and I do recommend uh, Tools Lateralis. There's some background music if anyone's feeling inspired. <laughs> As everyone's completing the questions, I guess one thing is uh, like Laura and I spoke a few times before this, there were so many different angles that we could have taken for this, uh, for sharing a few thoughts and taking that discussion too. Uh, so just, just highlighting that. Uh, we could have gone into very, all the different methods and approaches and the similarities for them. Just notice one of the questions up there around you know, different examples. Challenges are so many different examples that we could highlight, which is why we're just probably going to be sitting more at that conceptual level, because um, you all would have had lots of experience uh, in doing that across very different um, contexts. So maybe if we move on to that first slide. Okay. That's really interesting to see. So a lot of people working in just evaluation, but also a decent number working in both. So, okay, and perhaps use the chat, everyone. Um, for those who are working in evaluation, or just said just evaluation, uh, I'm, I'm interested in whether monitoring the monitoring and evaluation work, whether you conceive of that as being similar to social impact measurement. So it's a, you know, a thought or two and it would be helpful because I find that a very interesting comment. I was not expecting that. 
I thought that most people would be putting both. But clearly there's such different identities between the different communities and the culture and way of approaching it. Mm. Laura? And also neither. I'm curious who those neithers are and what you do for work. Um, or whether there's uh, people learning here. Um, so people undertaking studies in um, or masters in this area that are, are seeking to work. Ah, there we go. So Claudette studying evaluation um, and perhaps seeking to work in this space in the future or just learn a little bit more about it. It's a good point, Susan, as well, that monitoring are relevant to both. Um, and so, and I guess I, I just vividly remember when I first learned about developmental evaluation and I'm like, this is what I do when I work in partnership. This is, this makes a lot of sense to me. Why is this evaluation? So hence the overlap uh, between them. So it's quite, quite interesting to see that. And on Susan's point, Simon, do you see monitoring as a part of your work in social impact measurement or it is social impact measurement? Uh, just, just, just to be clear, I see my work as working with clients to work out what the, where to go and whether they're doing well or not. So that's the broad labels. Now, social impact measurement is a component of that and evaluation is a component of that. So I think that's, that's important. So monitoring is necessarily a part of both that. You need to be able to monitor how the program is being delivered, what's going on to be able to make, to get the evidence collected over time, to be able to then make those assessments. And those assessments could come through with those different culture and identities. An interesting point from Caitlin there as well. So if you have a responsive and embedded evaluation team, can't it be both? That's, and Caitlin, I mean, that's, that's sort of where I naturally went to. And I find this quite uh, revealing and interesting um, as we're working through this now. And that point from Jess at the end, I still haven't figured out the difference, it seems to be a different origin and, and an origin story. Um, and so those different cultures and identities. And so that's where I want, like, you know, maybe maybe um, in the version tomorrow, we could do a, a quick Maya Briggs test or some other personality test, to understand whether that culture and identity actually comes through in the type of people who identify as evaluators versus those who identify more in social impact measurement. So maybe if we move on to the second polling question. Okay, okay well, that answers our question. That is, I feel a sense of relief. Laura, how do you feel? Oh, me too. Pretty definitive answer, I think. Um, I think that matches with what everybody's saying in the chat as well, um, that there is a lot of overlap between the two. Yeah, yeah. And, and then it becomes, um, just noticing point from Kathy uh, around adding evaluation expertise. And I think this is where the different methods and approaches sort of come to the fore. And how we can all think of ourselves as professionals working in this space. This space is to support organizations, either being embedded as a part of it or coming from the outside and being able to work out what's where to go and what's working or not. Mm. And there's a whole bunch of different approaches and tools we need to use. And I think Eleanor said that as well from the other mm. side. So practicing evaluation, but trying to embed more social impact measurement in that approach. Yes. So interesting, people approaching it from two different sides, but trying to get to a, a place where you can use both techniques as needed. Okay. So, and maybe on to the next question. Uh, so this is the word, word cloud question. Um, what's the one word that best describes what we can learn from each other? We've got a lot of right. impact, purpose, collaboration. So Language. Language is a, an interesting one. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm drawn to the two which are bigger, which is the impact and the purpose. I find that quite uh, important, actually. Uh, if we're, because that's where we're both with our different mindsets and identity trying to um, strive towards, create impact possibly with purpose or having clear purpose around that. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes back to the, the fit for purpose and that rigor 
audience purpose again by saying that impact and that purpose that you'll create will be different for different clients and different purposes. So, um, yeah, it's being able to, to best best deliver those outcomes for whoever you're working with. Um, ego's an ego. Yeah. yeah, who mentioned ego? And do they want to type in the chat um, what they mean by that? It's a really interesting word. Maybe. While, while, while we're waiting for ego, I mean, just that's that for me is um, wonderful to see um, because it does relate to our professional identities. And so we've got a lot riding on the label, back to your point, Laura, the label that we associate with ourselves, like who are we? And that's where I was trying to uh, highlight that the evaluator identity is quite strong. And social impact measurer isn't an identity. It's more there's a community around social impact measurement that's developing through SIMNA. Interesting. So I think Jesse was talking about the ego and saying it's something we need to manage as we consider our identity, as Simon was just talking about, being able to be honest with ourselves, I think, about where we are and what we seek to do, which is really important. So that might relate to the rigor point um, and being humble. It's like uh, first, you know, framing that as how far do we need to go to get a meaningful answer? And it's appreciating what we don't know in those environments. And that might be based on time, skills, the community we might be working in, the area we might be working in as well. It's a very important point. Hmm. So maybe moving on to the last question. So this touches on the skills. So are evaluators and the social impact measurement community using the same skills? And there seems to be quite a bit of overlap there um, in the yeah. skills that are being used. So I think that matches with what we've heard already. And it points to some of the comments and that, that sense of regardless of which community you you normally affiliate with um, or what work you're selling or how you've positioned within an organization, the different methods and approaches you use could fit under, under both. So it feels like there's, there's a, it's more, that's probably more convergence than I thought might be the case. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of a comment um, before from Kate, it was, uh, about the different sets of skills. Um, as and then a, uh, an adjective sort of describing the evaluator identity, a qualitative evaluator versus a quantitative evaluator. And I think that just points to the multiple different identities that exist in both um, communities and approaches that we are, are talking about right now. And, and I think Kathy makes a really good point in the chat as well by saying, you know, we probably have the same core goal of how can we make resources more, most efficiently used um, to improve the way that we the way that we work and the way the world operates. So that's a, a really common purpose that we can strive to. So maybe I can pop this out there. So this is now you know turning up turning up the heat. Uh, we're forty minutes into the the um, into into this webinar. So just turn up the heat a little bit. The the AES vision is specifically about quality evaluation rather than it being this is the view of the world and what's required and I find I found that really interesting now I also know that websites and material can be um, old I know that Simnas is and we've got to need to be able to update that uh, but I just wanted to turn the dial up a little bit because that for me is a really important point if that's the case then that changes part of our identity and our culture and what we're all striving to achieve. Because then we can agree of some core different um, uh, uh, ways of approaching monitoring, measurement, um, evaluation. So that, that's also hopefully a spark for some uh, chat comments too. Definitely. Not just to you, Laura, not just to you. <laughs> I think what you're saying is we need to, to update some of the language. <laughs> but it's, a, it's, it's, it's not just the language thing. This is a core around who we are now. I, I emphasise that the evaluation identity and evaluation, evaluator identity 
is much more progressed than the similar one. So in some respects, it's easier for a smaller group of people to come together and make a statement about where we're heading and what it looks like versus a larger group, clear professional pathways, master's degrees, it's all there laid out. So it's it's not the same and it's not just changing some words. There's something really core here about how we think of ourselves and how we affiliate with that. And do you think it's how people come to the practice, whether they are formally learning how to be an evaluator through formal study versus pick, maybe picking it up on the job um, in social impact measurement? I think so. And I think that points to, uh, I think that's actually really important. Um, and that's what's, there's, there's pros and cons for this and they're equal, <laughs> but the, the pro around that with um, the similar and social impact measurement world is that it can, it's open to many, all, give it a shot, come and learn what's appropriate for you to do right now versus what you highlighted up front, Laura, which I think is right, which is a higher baseline level of rigor within the evaluation community to be able to do that work. Um, pros and cons for both, but I do think that's that's definitely part of it. And a really good point there from Alan as well, saying maybe the, the AES vision reflects um, the evaluation culture being focused on objectivity, robustness, technique. Yeah. Um, that last part of it, though, is interesting. I've not yet met an evaluator who doesn't also want to change the world for the better. Um, and being clear about what that world actually needs to look like. We all have different views about what the world looks like. And do we need to be able to come to a view about what that is in terms of our professional practices? Or being object, what does objective mean without it being underpinned by a set of values? So all of that starts, and this is the bit where we could unravel this and take one word and spend an hour talking about it as well. Um, so what does objectivity mean when you're coming in with your own cultural biases, with your own professional biases based on your own experiences too? Mm. And I think your cultural and professional biases certainly affect what projects you choose to take on if, if you have the luxury of choice. Yeah. Um, and often people, and, and I myself, um, work in areas that I think are going to be most impactful. Um, so I certainly try to progress um, society in a way that I see um, is the most valuable, but everybody will have different perspectives on, on what that value, where that value sits. Well said, very well said. I think Ken makes an interesting point as well about um, how again, picking up on the how people come to evaluation or how people come to social impact measurement, um, saying he never thought he'd be an evaluator. And I completely agree. I never thought I'd work in evaluation either. So I don't have formal training in evaluation. Um, it's certainly been much more on the job learning. So it's interesting the different routes yeah. you can take to get there. Yeah, yeah. But I think it is becoming much more common to have um, some form of, of formal education in this area. Indeed, indeed. Um, well, that's a lot of um, discussions there. It's pretty good. Thanks very much for Lauren Simon. That's a great presentation. We have some questions already um, that came through. Some of you already uh, answered. Um, so here's a question um, because there were so many self-identified evaluators in the room. So Simon, would you be able to provide a brief overview or example of what a social impact measurement project would look like? And, um, you know, for different contexts and audience, just very briefly, how would yeah. that look like this project for you? Sure, sure. Uh, so I will start, this is where I've probably avoided a bit throughout, but using the labels um, and approaches, I think that a social impact measurement project can often sound like, hey, we're doing an outcomes framework. So setting up the process for being able to collect the data over time. But inherent in that is also the cultural change that's required. So a social impact measurement project is often got that focus with working with the organization and the team and being able to establish the right tools and data collection approaches, uh, being able to then work out what to do with that data and be able to uh, stick with that over time. One example um, of a social impact measurement project um, at the moment I'm working on, it's been 
it's, it's already been a year and it's got another year and it's an ongoing relationship. It's with um, uh, CAFS, Children and Family Services out in, in um, Ballarat and being able to work with them over the past year to sort of set up the thinking around what are the changes for their many different programs. And then so it's the logic models um, and coming up with an overarching theory of change and then subsequently working out what exactly do they need to measure and then what to do with that. And that's where I think the cultural difference may come through, may come through. I say may because undoubtedly uh, many of the evaluation community would be doing that as well, but then be able to then say, what does this mean? What can we learn within the organisation as they're collecting data? So at that stage now of some data being collected, presented in dashboards, what changes do we make now? Hopefully that's all right without going off on too much of a tangent for a long time. Okay, um, we have um, another question here. So um, the, Laura and Simon can address that. Um, so the audience of the purpose are things you both mentioned as very important, something that you had in your presentation as well. Um, can you give some examples of what kinds of approach uh, work well or better for different audience or contexts? Laura, I spoke just before, please. Um, really interesting question. Um, I think it often depends. So, for example, with the purpose question, um, the purpose of the evaluation in, in the work that I do, often it's, it's very much an independent arm's length. The client doesn't want to have very much involvement at all. They want this to be a very much an independent process. So they'll often set up what the evaluation should look like, who it should involve, um, what kind of questions it should ask, what methods it should use. And then it just steps back and says, off, off you go, do your work and come back and tell us what your findings are. Um, we don't want to influence the way that uh, those findings develop. We just want to have those presented at the end. Um, so I think that's um, a, a very good example of how the purpose, which was a very independent approach, um, has meant that we've shaped our process so that we largely run the show and um, deliver an independent findings at the end. Um, on the kind of the opposite end of the scale, if it's much more of a participatory engagement uh, approach, it will be working with a client um, and working with communities on an ongoing basis. So that will often involve um, designing how the evaluation is set up. Uh, who should be engaged in that process and then doing that on a really regular basis. So saying um, this, is, this is our initial thinking on the evaluation, getting feedback on that, um, workshopping it with clients, workshopping it with reference groups, uh, and then doing that throughout the process just to make sure that we're on track and we're delivering what's needed. Um, and that's a much more engaged uh, approach for the purpose of uh, feeling like there is engagement and having that engagement, but also embedding that learning. So as the evaluation findings emerge, the client and the community can learn about those findings. And Simon, any other thoughts on that? Just to highlight that there's, there's so much overlap in what we're talking about. We're just using slightly different labels at different points. And then I, I wonder if the and devil in the detail around the types of clients. So as you're describing that, uh, Laura, I couldn't go, I couldn't help but go, oh, of course, that's the same as what I'm doing with a particular government client I'm working with right now. Um, so I, I wonder if, and, and trouble is that sometimes we can't talk about it explicitly. Um, so in something isn't out in the public domain, um, it's confidential information, we can't talk about it. So that might be a, a barrier around talking about some of this, but it just feels like there's so much which is similar. We've just got slightly different labels. And I wonder if still underpinning that is a difference in mindset or approach in how we are going about it. So when you're talking about working in community, I'm like, okay, what does that look like? Is that where you're hearing the voice we're thinking about data sovereignty with indigenous communities are we thinking about who owns which part of it and then how the information is used afterwards to make decisions and then where resources might subsequently be used i feel like there's like on the surface it feels like there's a lot of similarities devil in the detail sectors might be different and then how we're we're going about it in practice might differ even within and i don't think this is a a, a social impact measurement evaluated difference but in 
each of us as individuals or organizationally, how we approach work. Definitely. And that community can be different things. As you say, it might be working with Indigenous is looking at data sovereignty and, and, and those sorts of issues. Um, it could also just be a reference group and that is your audience and, and mm. for them you are delivering purpose. So it's making sure that you have their buy-in and um, their engagement throughout the process. So you're right, it is in the detail. Um, I have a couple of questions from Eleonore. Um, she asked me that she wants to ask you guys directly. Uh, so there have been some really interesting ones coming through from the chat. Thanks, Paula. There was uh, this idea of developmental evaluation uh, was mentioned as an increasingly popular approach uh, in, in, the develop in the evaluation community. Laura, I'd be really interested to hear more around if you, uh, more about how this particular approach overlaps with social impact from your perspective. And then Simon, um, yourself as well. Very interesting question. Um, I mean, for me, and, and based on uh, learnings from Simon today as well, I take away that uh, evaluation, it, from my perspective, is, is often much more arm's length and social impact measurement is much more kind of working, engaged with the community and delivering those findings kind of as you go to make sure that you can make those changes as you need it as a program rolls out. Uh, developmental evaluation, I would say, would have some similarities in the approach in that you would be seeking to work with, uh, with your client or, or with whatever that community might be as a program rolls out to make sure that you can make those progress changes as you go. Um, but I see maybe it's where the effort is distributed. And I would say a developmental evaluation would culminate in, in more effort delivered towards the end of a project. Whereas with social impact measurement, I wonder whether that's distributed more evenly throughout a project. I'd be curious to hear Simon's thoughts on that. Uh Yes. So, oh, many thoughts. Um, great question. Great question. Um, I've always struggled that developmental evaluation was part of evaluation. I come from a background as a strategy management consultant, and I looked at developmental evaluation as I'm working in partnership with you. Let's learn. Things are complex. It's dynamic. Let's do it right away. So let's make changes then right away. So I find that that, that part for me I've always struggled with. Um, and that for me helped, helped me appreciate when I first touched on this probably about uh, eight or so years ago, it was an underst better understanding about evaluation mindsets and what we've been talking about a bit today. Um, I, I do think that there's, with that... Um, with the approach for developmental evaluation and where, where, where projects are scoped with an evaluator mindset coming in versus someone who's coming from more of the social impact measurement mindset, there's a, there's a different sense of what's possible and where it goes. And particularly with social impact measurement, it should lead to a point in time which becomes the evaluation. But there's a point in time where we say, this, is, this has worked or not. So it's making those calls about what's what's required so again i think this is labels that we're talking the way labels that we are using we need to get that's really crisp and clear around what we mean by them and where and where that goes and i think just to add one more point to that i think often with the clients i work with there can be a lot of fear in the way that a program might have changed over the course of evaluation and and i mentioned in my talk with maintaining fidelity of a program mm. continuity of a program and you know if you change the program too much you might not be able to evaluate it against its original aims so i think that's that's often seen as an issue that needs to be overcome rather than a, a an exciting um in, brace of of new data as it emerges and how can we you know make this fit for purpose as we go so i think it is the mindset that you enter that with but that's that's a massive assumption then that what we set out to start with the objective and that's not or shouldn't change and we're not adapting for example an emergence mindset around mm -hmm. We've got, and this is where I think developmental evaluation starts to push towards more of the innovative, different types of programs where it's like, well, we're not sure what the, the objective might change. Therefore, 
um, let's use more of an emergence theory sort of that underpins exploring what the consequences, changes may be in the data that we're collecting at the time. So I think there's quite a lot in that, uh, that, that point around, we set out to achieve X, have we achieved X? Versus we set out to achieve X, then it could have been Y or Z or A to F, um, which changes the whole dynamic of it. Mm. And I wonder if it's because a lot of the work that I do is, um, you know, final final term evaluations of programs that have been running for five years. And right. When the program yeah. was set up, the way of thinking was we need to deliver exactly as we said, um, and we will measure on that in five years. Mm. And so there's very much a, a trueness to the original purpose rather than new purpose as it might evolve. Mm -hmm. um, we might move to some closing remarks. We've only got about two minutes to go before uh, I imagine quite a few people will have to leave. Uh, but then of course there are the 15 minutes where we continue exploring these concepts because there's now lots of action happening in the chat and lots of things to, to keep going with. But thank you both. Yeah, um, thanks. I want to thank all participants today uh, for making this event with two communities a great success and with the first event. So hopefully we can do that later in the future. Uh, thank you as well for Simon and Laura for leading the dialogue, developing the presentation, answering as many questions as they could. And I love the presentation from Laura and the spectrum. And I really like the analogy from Simon. Um, so yeah, thanks for the presentations. The key takeaways for me are that social impact measurement and evaluation are both discipline agnostic, have overlaps but they use slightly different words. Um, both involves critical thinking, compile evidence to make judgment and bring accountability. Um, SIM is an emerging field of practice and evaluation is well established and with evaluation attracting people from different parts. Um, one of the key differences that I've heard a lot during the session was the, um, between those two communities is the cultural difference and the labels used. Um, so thank you very much for everyone. We do have a lot, uh, your feedback is very much appreciated. We're just having a final Mentimeter link that just, just in the chat now. So just provide feedback to this on, on this session. We'll leave this uh, Zoom um, open for another 15 minutes for whoever still have time and want to ask questions. And depending on the number of people we, we still have in the Zoom, we can break out into rooms um, and then we just can hang out here for another 15 minutes um, if you want, or we can just stay in the same room and then just answer the other questions that just came up here at the last minute. So stay if you can. If not, um, thank you very much and hope to see you in the next webinar. I'll kick off with just uh, picking up on, on one of Kathy's points in the chat. Um, do you think either social impact measurement or evaluation thinking fits better with social innovation and for purpose start -offs, startups? I think that's a really interesting point um, and something, something, Simon, that maybe you deal with more, um, considering I work, I would say I work much more exclusively in the evaluation space, whereas you might be a, a bit more of a, a crossover that spectrum. So, Kathy, I think uh, that comes back to the uh, associated um, identities with each label. And my sense is with something which is newer, smaller, startup, innovative, uh, going in with less of that rigorous, we've got to reach a certain threshold and more of a let's learn what we can mindset. And if we've got that spectrum and social neck measurement is on the generally the less rigorous spectrum, then that's probably going to be more appropriate mindset to take to those um, type of uh, projects, programs, organizations. With the biggest caveat, go back to purpose, audience, and rigor, because it may be that uh, you've had a private equity in investor um, give you $100 million to try something out, and it's going to change the world. And it might be different um, <laughs> purpose, audience, and the level of rigor required to be able to prove that up. I, can I make a comment? Is that okay? Yeah. So I find most of the time that the social impact measurement stuff works. And then along the journey, there feels like there's the need for a little mini evaluation. It's almost like a little pilot evaluation to test a product. And it's usually to get investors or to know whether to scale. So I think it's quite interesting that 
when I'm doing that kind of work, I don't, I, yeah, I don't feel like the social impact approach always gets me to where I need to go. So it's an interesting area. Mm. Laura? Oh. <laughs> um, really good point. And I wonder what is it that, uh, where, what do you see as that gap between where you can get to with social impact measurement and where you need to get to? It's usually when there's a need to convince a stakeholder. And so you need something that's um, either more independent, which is a point that you made earlier. So mm -hmm. it's an outside in yeah. evidence base, or it's got, um, it's more defined that you're proving that something is happening but often it's only a piece of the solution. So you're not evaluating the whole thing, but the ongoing evidence isn't quite enough. It's almost like you need mm -hmm. to stop, do a little evaluation that's independent, a bit more rigorous to get a decision made, and then you can keep going. Can I, I, I can't just chip in, because I think that that is, that's I think a classic example of where once you get, if you start with, the audience, purpose, and rigor. If you're really clear on that, let's not worry about the social impact measurement or evaluation labels, because what you can then do is go to that next level below, which is what's the appropriate method or approach that we need to use to be able to provide what's required for the based on that purpose, audience, and rigor. And that's where possibly these labels, and this comes back to one of Laura's first points about, you know, are labels important? Yes. Can they be detracting from what's really core and the similarities? And so this is the you know, similarity differences. Maybe this is very more on the, we're, we're probably talking about the same sort of thing when it comes to it, but maybe there's a mindset of um, adaptability that might have a bit more of a bent towards um, one domain or other. Mm. Well, it's interesting because I've, I've even been involved in doing what have been portrayed as reviews or management reviews, and then you go, well, this looks like sort of a classic evaluation or said, we want you to do an evaluation of this program and what they're looking at is their management structure, um, skills, right. different training, and all, which it would be almost classically be called a review. So I think the language is just really sloppy at the one level but irrelevant at another level. I think you're absolutely right about the Holy Trinity, uh, Simon. I often see reviews with evaluation frameworks. So yeah. I'd completely agree with that. Which is to your point, Laura, which is the critical thinking, which is the similarity between them. So it's critical thinking requires a structure. Mm. Uh, that's one. Oh, well, that's culturally loaded, but let's just work with that for the moment. <laughs> Other critical thinking may not have to have that kind of approach, but, you know, for most of what we're talking about here, having a structure is important. And that structure can relate to a framework that you can then use to guide your thinking. So most of social impact measurement world will also be a, about the mindset and the, and the structured thinking that you can have that allows you to be able to start to draw insights and create uh, more information to make decisions. And both have evidence, but that the nature of that evidence uh, the volume of that evidence could be quite different. Yeah. Do you um, do you see those two, you know, chains of thoughts, those two communities at some point being one, or you know, becoming one in the near future? Great question, Laura. <laughs> Ah, it's a really good question. Something I was going to ask earlier, but thought it might have been a bit too antagonistic, but I'll go for it. Um, considering Simna was set up after AES, you obviously saw a gap in the market that you could fill. Curious to hear what that was and, and why there was a need to set up a new community um, that AES obviously wasn't meeting the needs of. Yeah, I'll sure. To you. <laughs> <laughs> great, great question. Um, so, and, and look, the way, the way I'd like to answer that is that uh, there is a very strong evaluator identity and the world of social impact measurement and the people attracted to it do not identify as evaluators. And the approach and the thinking that sort of sits behind Simna is much more broad based. It's much more about people who come from very different types of disciplines um, who are trying to work out 
whether things are working well and how to be able to track that over time. There's probably more of a the money angle, so the investment community, and that affiliation initially with Simna was much more strongly with the social return on investment world. Um, so there's there's a few different uh, genesis differences uh, that are coming through. Um, yeah, as a part of of that of that story, but it's it's it. There's always, and there's always going to be within the AES community as well, like different groups that form with different ways of thinking about um, the world. So that's, I don't see that being um, necessary that if we're going to come together. So I don't think there is. I think there's a way of, there's different mindsets, there's different cultures and identity, and that's healthy. And there's a different focus for where those groups begin to move, which is why we don't always have mergers between similar types of organizations. Um, because it's like, well, there's a slightly different bent to how they're approaching the world. Mm. Anyway, that's probably one question as well we riff on for about an hour or two. <laughs> and yeah. I think um, Jess has a question there. Yeah, just is social impact assessment and social impact measurement, uh, am I seeing two different things and then I understand that social impact assessment has come out of environmental impact assessment. Um, and yeah, so I, I suppose that's my first question. Um, but then I, I've done a bit of academic reading on social impact assessment, hopefully, I, I don't know if that's different to measurement and then also on evaluation theory. And there appears to be no overlap between the authors and like, is anybody writing papers on, on these similar things? Because they're definitely sometimes overlapping. Like that's the message from this. And yet they're not talking to each other in any of the academic literature I've read. Great question. Um, actually in preparation for this, I did look up the academic literature and I found a paper um, that was written after a joint conference in the States where they asked the question of, how do these two communities fit together? So I'll see if I can find it while we're chatting and pop it in the chat. That would be great. Thank you. It might be an opportunity for collaboration. Sim, sim the AES uh, joint paper. <laughs> but even, but even some of that's really uh, just your point. Uh, it's it's really big because I think all of those have different genesis stories and different people and where they want to do their thinking, do their approach. I, it didn't even occur to me when I was talking to Laura to look up something from the academic literature. It's just not my world. I do not go there. So, and I'm not saying that's on the, the back of everyone that's in the community. There's actually lots of people looking at a few right now who actually go down that path and make sure that there is you know, what has been the evidence that's been published in the academic literature, but there might be a different mindset um, from those different worlds based on those Genesis stories as well about where it's shared. And then because it's there's such big industries, like with a lot of social impact assessment, if it's more focused around environmental um, analysis, that's a huge industry. And there's a huge focus around that. So you can have like, you can imagine the, the circles that have some level of overlap, but they're not, there's the end of end diagram, it's not too much of an overlap. I've just put the paper in the chat. It's quite interesting. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. Um, and assessment and um, measurement. Uh, it's just different, different genesis stories. Like, so oh, social they're, impact they're assessment, different. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, sorry, I, there will be techniques used in social impact assessment that have parallels with everything that we've discussed today. But yeah. social impact assessments have been much more aligned with environmental assessments overall and mm -hmm. having uh, as the cent central part. And then there's some social uh, overlay rather than being central. So it's like, where's the starting point of what we're trying to do? In the end, we're all, there's money that's probably been invested in a thing. We need to work out whether the thing is working or not. And then we need to work out where we, what we want to do differently in the future, or we're trying to work out what to do at the start. So that's where all of this comes into. And it's a different type of critical thinking and analysis. And we've also got these different labels associated with it. I think you're right. It comes back to that accountability. Yeah. I, for fear of dominating too much. I think that accountability point is really interesting because one of the reasons that I sort of have then gone into qualifications and, and academic reading on 
evaluation and social impact assessment is because I think that quality is not always there um, because the professionalization of these sectors is relatively new. And um, I, I see the real value in, in having different cultures and, and different streams of something that is related. But are we also in danger of, um, yeah, perhaps not reaching um, some level of professional standard and not sharing some of our learnings because it's more informal and more um, disjointed? Great, great points. Can I chip in? Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, um, <laughs> just because I, I run and have been doing it for a decade, the social value and social return on investment um, accredited training. And part of the story that we have up front is that it took us 2000 years to get to the stage where we've got our accounting systems. So just counting money, we've got and profit and loss statements, we've got balance sheets. So it's taken a long time to develop those professional standards. And with that particular aspect of social impact measurement or um, the, the SROI social value world. Uh, the thing is that we well, it's going to take 2000 years to get to those standards. So let's just remind ourselves if we want to get the right accounting for value rather than just accounting for cash, it's going to take time. So I hear what you're saying. And I think it takes time to be able to build up those identities and the professional pathways associated with it. And our social impact measurement is more on the, the sense of we're, we're going to be trying to do something and learn now. So we're going to be able to take different approaches and be able to, to do that so that we can get clearer about what's working, what's not, what changes do we need to make. But I hear what you're saying, um, and it'd be nice to see the evolution happen faster. And I think on the other, oh, I, no, go ahead, Greg. I was going to say, on the other hand, and this doesn't always make me popular in the AES community, there are risks that you know, we all know about of, of over-professionalising. You end up in your own cul-de-sac where you become self-referencing, inward-looking and elitist and exclusionary and defeat the very purpose that a lot of us have talked about today, which is about social change and improvement and organisational improvement. And if we become a bit precious about our little patch, um, and I'm not suggesting that's what you were saying, Jess, but, I mean, that can be the risk mm -hmm. of going... Um, in, in attempting to deal with the sort of problem Simon said is, you know, let's get clear about how and why we do things and getting a common vocabulary, we can end up you know, going too far the other way. Absolutely. And I think so. Uh, that's, that's one of the problems or the challenges that I raised as well is because of this later development of or professionalisation, as you say, of these ways of thinking or characterization of these ways of thinking, uh, there are challenges in performing a, an evaluation role or performing a social impact measurement role. Um, with, as I mentioned, my evaluation units being established in, in government departments or in, um, in large non-for-profits, I'm finding that the evaluation units that I work with are very um, embracing of evaluation and, and measurement and accountability, and they want that to drive performance. But a lot of the broader kind of department or, or organization aren't because they haven't that message of the value of evaluation hasn't yet spread um, and so I think until that does there's going to be some challenges with how we perform our work mm. thank you thanks great questions well, I'm conscious that we have reached our over time <laughs> of 15 minutes. <laughs> and then I can see that from a few people left here that could go on for much longer. Um, but I think we do need to close the session and um, thank you everyone who sticks around and um, was interested in the webinar. We are running a webinar tomorrow as well. So if you're 